I first started thinking about the word trespass a lot during the last political administration. It just seemed like the correct term for what was happening with the government, with who was in the White House, with the way that civil rights were being trespassed upon. And so that was just a word that kept kind of rolling around my brain even prior to the pandemic. And then I also kind of related the term to the way that humans are operating on the planet these days, just with the sort of hyperactivity of late capitalism and plundering of resources and plundering of the environment that trespassing, I was like, feel like humans are going to places environmentally that they shouldn't be going to. Based on an aerial photo of a river in Oregon, I thought it would be a really interesting piece to have the river be a mirror so that when you walked past it, you were seeing yourself kind of reflected in the landscape. And then I wanted to do the landscape in plastic, particularly because we tend to romanticize landscape and as being sort of a nature as being this eternal, unchanging thing when we romanticize it and we think it does, it's always going to be here, it's always going to look like this. But the way things are rolling around with wildfires and insane temperatures, like it's kind of getting to the point where nature is maybe not eternal and we need to really be thinking about that. So the idea was that, yeah, you're looking at this beautiful romantic landscape in a way, but then it's, it's marred by man-made materials. A couple of years ago, I decided I would recycle our household plastic as much as I could, basically any kind of plastic bag or packaging material that came into our house and try and recycle it back into the art. I, a couple of years ago, I stopped buying any new yarn. So my goal is just to use what I already own and not buy anything else. When I say new, I mean, you know, new from a store. I'm still allowed to thrift an estate sale and I'm allowed to accept donations. <laughs> so post-consumer, I'm fine with. I just don't want to buy anything because that whole, even the whole textile fiber industry is, has super toxic byproducts and a lot of it's made from plastic. <laughs> The first piece I crocheted was, I started it in like 2006, and that was a cityscape of Portland, and it was very loosely based on just a little Sharpie pen sketch, and then gradually started taking pictures of buildings in Portland. But that piece was a patchwork. You know, I would crochet bits and pieces and then lay it out and figure out how it went together. It still definitely kind of worked from the center out. But while I was making that, I started doing portraits for the first time. Working from the center out is the only way that works technically, for me anyway, the way I work. I wanted to use the lines of crochet to describe facial structure. And so it's much harder to decrease stitches and go in to a center than it is to start at one point and increase and go out. And that way I could also change direction and I could use the rows of crochet to describe eye sockets and bridge of the nose and all the features. The whole point of doing male nudes in my medium, it's a feminist attitude. It's redressing the balance of male artists depicting naked women. That's overplayed in my opinion. And I think when I came up with the idea of doing a nude, one, it was a technical challenge for myself to see if I could make it work with the yarn, but also a feminist statement. And I also thought there's a lot of humor in it as well, I think, to crushing these giant muscular men in this medium that's considered to be pretty feminine and homey.
I wanted to see if I could do a nude or partial nude completely out of plastic. So there's no yarn in that piece. It's all household plastic and old videotape because my fella used to own a video store. So we have quite a few old videotapes lying around and I couldn't, there's no way I could find enough black plastic to make a piece of that size. Last year I crocheted a little tiny nude just as an experiment. You know, it's only about maybe a foot long. And I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with it. I had a few different ideas. I was looking at the big nude and looking at his tattoos and he's got a tattoo of a butterfly on his torso. And I, yeah, I was thinking about, you know, moths develop these markings from evolution that are designed to have them blend with their environments or to look like something else. And so, I thought, well, what if a moth had a human tattoo on it in the same way that humans tattoo animals and butterflies and things on their bodies? And so it was loosely based on a real moth, but then I incorporated the tiny nude into the wingspan and then did a, a mirror image of the nude on the other side. So he, and obviously it's a completely made up creature, but the moths have those names. It's a one-eyed sphinx moth. So he's a Western tattooed man moth. As soon as I thought of it, I kind of knew that it was going to be my medium, even before I sort of started. I had gone with a friend to see a show at the old Contemporary Craft Gallery when it was over in Layer Hill, and they had a show in 2006. It was all art made using craft materials. There wasn't any crochet in it. There was tapestry and uh, sewing and needlepoint and embroidery, and so. I left that show that day thinking, I wonder, and I'd been crocheting for years. I crocheted as a kid and knitted and then crocheted as, took it up again as a teenager and just, I'd make hats for my friends. And so I'd always done it for fun. And since art school, I'd always been kind of looking for a medium that as far as I could tell didn't exist because I tried everything. I tried video and film and writing and painting and drawing and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, it was definitely a revelation. The same day that I saw that show, I went home and I pulled out this little sketch and I started crocheting city blocks and I made a little square of like six little diagonal aerial view city blocks. And then I was, that was it, I was away. And I haven't really painted since, hardly. <laughs> Oftentimes when I want to do a piece that's for me is experimental where I'm just going to try something a bit different, I'll often use my own face because I don't care about messing up my own face in the same way that if I'm doing somebody else's portrait. So that's why there's self-portraits that, you know, are the weirdo ones. <laughs> it's just easier to do that with my own face. But I wanted to do something that kind of looked where you could see the portrait in it, but the stitches and the way it was rendered would really draw attention to the yarn and the way it was made. You know, because like I say, my work is always these sort of contour lines of maps of following the face, but oftentimes I'll be changing colors and mixing colors mid row that you aren't necessarily so aware of the rows. So that piece was basically, I'm gonna do the whole face just in stripes and contours. You know, I definitely simplified it and just used the brightest colors that I could. The metamorphic thing was more, I know it, it refers to molten rock in reality, but also just the metamorphosis of the face into the yarn and that play between the material and the image that I really enjoy that with the yarn that you can kind of go between paying attention to the surface and the materiality and then also what it's portraying.